pray, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the great privilege of knowing that your word is your will, for having a place like this where we can come to study your word and to be blessed by it. And Father, I thank you again for the greatness of the word that lives in our heart and the love we have to you for that word. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. God bless. You may be seated. I'd like for you to go to the book of Galatians tonight, please. Last night I taught the first chapter in the opening session of the camp, the National Pilot Council camp. And having been in the book of Galatians a little while, getting ready for the National Pilot Council camp, of course, the second chapter is part of the book. <laughs> and I just got so blessed working Galatians again and just reading it and letting it simmer in my life that I thought I'd like to share this second chapter with you in this service at this time, at 7.30 tonight, we'll have our second service here at International. And tonight at 7.30, during the course of that service, we'll have the wonderful privilege of hearing another four of our core who will be graduating this August give their presentation, their graduation presentation. And that, of course has been a real blessing to all of our hearts every Sunday night in the second service for a number of weeks. I missed last Sunday night, but as you all know, I had it filmed, so I looked at it this week, and I got real blessed. Sort of got misty a few times about my kids. See, these core kids, we eat and sleep and live together, and they know my heart, I know theirs, and there's just something, there's a rapport between us you can't define in terms, but it's sure there. And I just get so blessed, and it was again wonderful. And tonight again at 7.30, if you'd like to be in the service, we certainly welcome you to be a part of that second service. The book of Galatians is a real great book on renewed mind because by the time the book of Galatians was given where God instructed Paul to write it, they had begun to make some real solid doctrinal commitments. They were totally erroneous, but they had made them. And therefore, he sort of jerks them up in this book of Galatians to pay attention and get back on the ball for God. And it's one of the great records in the word on the renewed mind because once you have come to a doctrinal position regarding something, you have practiced that particular error over a period of time. So naturally, it sort of has, it has sort of solidified itself in your walk. It's like today. The general so-called Christianity that people follow and believe is Christianity, if the Bible's right, I'd say about 85% of what we're practicing is contrary to the Word. But we're real sincere about it. Everybody believes it's Basically, they believe that it's Christianity, and it has sort of solidified itself, and they made doctrines out of it. This is the early church, too. The Galatians had sort of made doctrines, and that's why it's a great record on the renewed mind. When I want to work the renewed mind, I work in depth those records in the church epistles that basically deal with the doctrine. Like, you know, Romans, Corinthians, then what? Galatians, doctrinal. Ephesians, Philippians, then what? Colossians. So sometime this week I'll most likely get to Colossians if I ever get through Galatians. But... You see, Galatians and Colossians are those great doctrinal books where people had made doctrines out of their misconception of 
the practical side of the walk because they failed to adhere to their great revelation given in the book of Romans and in the book of Ephesians. Verse 1 says, 14 years after. Whether this means after the three years in verse 18 or 14 years after his conversion, we are still holding in abeyance. We are not confident that we have the answer. But this 14 years was after some occurrence. Now, if you've got 14 years to develop something, you could come up with some beautiful doctrinal things. Right? And especially if you add three more years to it, you've got 17 years to develop the wrong stuff. And over that period of time, you can... You can Practice a lot of error and get to the place that you think that error is the truth. Fourteen years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas. And if you want to know who Barnabas was, you've got to read in Acts 4, 36. Titus, you've got to go to 2 Corinthians 2, 13 and a few other places. Then you can find out who these beautiful men were. And I went up by my sense knowledge. He went by what? Revelation. He went by revelation. Revelation is word of knowledge and word of what? Those are the only two revelation manifestations apropos to the occasion. He didn't go up because somebody said, look, I think you ought to take a trip to Jerusalem and see what's happening there. As a matter of fact, I think those men ought to meet you up there. After all, you're making a great impression among the Gentiles in this whole area. Now you ought to go over to Jerusalem and report what's going on. No, 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 no. That's the way we modern humans operate outside of the Word. He walked by revelation. This is my cooperation for the original that I taught last night in Acts in the first chapter, that the reason he never conferred with the apostles, he didn't confer with flesh and blood, is because what he received, he received from God by revelation, and he walked on it. Then he went into Arabia for a period of time, came back to Damascus, and then he went to Jerusalem. Later on, 14 years later, he went again to Jerusalem. And I went by revelation and communicated unto them that good news, that gospel, which I preach among the Gentiles. But privately, the word privately is, again, the word idios, I believe. You know, to, to individuals, not all at one time, but he'd get with this man and he'd tell, talk to him. Then he'd get with that one and talk to him, which were of reputation. These were men of reputation in endeavoring to hold forth the word. He is not talking about the governor of the state or the head senator. He is talking about those men who were holding forth the word of God to the best of their ability and knowledge. Lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. In other words, without, he went up by revelation so there would be no confusion so that he would be able to instruct them and teach them and share with the leaders. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Gentile or Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, <laughs> who came in secretly to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into what? Bondage. See, when the early church was walking, they knew the liberty wherewith Christ Jesus had set them free. But it was such a fantastic truth, so tremendously well, releasing and powerful and loving that some of the religious people said, well, now, that's too easy. That's just too good. It just can't be that simple. And therefore they said, well, I think we better reinstitute 
or continue to carry on with circumcision, perhaps water baptism, some of these other things, just to make sure. And some of these people were brought in. They came in secretly. They sort of slipped in the back door to spy out our liberty, our freedom, which we have in Christ Jesus, for the one purpose only that they could bring us back to what? Bondage. To whom we gave place by subjection? No, sir. Not for and what? The boy, he stood his ground. Really stood his ground. They came in and they started rapping. And they, Paul said we didn't give them one inch, not one iota. We stood, um, stood right up to their face and we said, now you're wrong. Did not give them any place whatsoever. But of these who seemed to be somewhat, they thought they were somewhat. He says, whosoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepts no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in, con in conference as they came in added nothing to me. Really a tremendous thing. When you have the renewed mind on God's word, God's word stands there no friends. Your, your brother or sister or mother or father or uncle or aunt doesn't cut any ice when it comes to God's Word. It's God's Word that stands par excellence. If they agree with God's Word, wonderful. If they don't, you still have the obligation of walking the Word. That's renewed mind. And as I said to our people last night, to talk about the renewed mind is easier than get people to do it. Because we mentally assent to the Bible being the Word of God. We even got it up here so people can't forget about it, but they apparently seem to at times in their action, in their walk. The Word of God is. <laughs> it's not the Word of God as it has been. It's a present reality. I suppose Walter would say it's a, some type of aorist tense active verb present. I don't know what he'd say. And I don't know what Bernie to do in Esther and Gil or make. All I know is that the Word of God is. And it's always a present reality now. The Word of God is as much our Word today as it was the first time it was ever spoken. That which God gave to the apostles back after the day of on the day of Pentecost and later, all of that which God gave is as much available to this group and this audience and those around the nations who will hear this teaching tonight as it was the first time it was ever given. God has not changed. His word has not changed. Therefore, it's always an eternal now. His word is the will of God. And you have to come in the renewed mind of that place that there is nothing that stands above that word. Not your best friend, not your husband, not your wife, not your grandma. Nobody. The word, the word, the word, and nothing but the word. <laughs> okay? Well, I love you, but boy, that's the word. Paul said, I did not give them one iota space. I stood right up to him and said, you're wrong. The word of God is the will of God. That's what he told them. Well, contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of uncircumcision was committed unto me as of the circumcision, Peter's ministry was to the circumcision. Paul, God had said to him, you get over there the Gentiles. Verse 8 is a parenthesis. For he that wrought effectually in Peter, the apostle of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James... Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace, the grace. You will notice 
in verse 3 of chapter 1, it says, Grace be to you and peace from what? God the Father. Whenever it is that grace of God, it always brings with it the peace. Here he says in verse 9 of chapter 2, they perceive the grace, divine favor, it's unmerited. That was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go unto the Gentiles and they would continue to minister among the circumcision. Only that we should remember the poor the same which also I was very happy forward, very concerned to do. Verse 11, But when Peter was come to Antioch, Antioch was the city where they were first called Christians. Before they were called Christians, they were called followers of the way. They were called Christians first in Antioch because these people acted like Christ was in them. They had said Christ in, Christian. That's the meaning of the word. And here Peter came to Antioch. And Paul said, I withstood him to the what? Man, now that is something. Both men of God. Peter was born again of God's Spirit, had a ministry of an apostle, right? Paul was born again of God's Spirit, had a ministry also. And when Peter came to Antioch, Paul had a fight with him. He withstood him to the face. I know his heart. I know how Paul must have cried within. Imagine Paul withstanding the great Peter. That Peter that was that hard fisherman converted, really a staunch man, the man who had gone to the house of Cornelius, that Peter, Paul withstood to the face. I want to tell you, that man, Paul, must have had a renewed mind. Because ordinarily, it would be the custom of a man to just cool it, to not say really what he would want to say or what needed to be said. But here you have the record of God's Word, and I told you it's a great teaching on renewed mind. Peter was camped to Antioch. I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed for, verse 12, before that certain came from Jerusalem by order of James. Peter did eat with the what? Sure. He sat down with them, he broke bread with them, he ate their food. But when they were come from Jerusalem by order of James, those people, when they came, then Peter withdrew from the Gentiles, separated himself, fearing, fearing them which were of the Lord. There's your key. I tell you, that fear is a damnable thing, isn't it? Great men like Peter cop out at times because of what? He was afraid of the circumcision boys that were coming. And therefore, he said, well, you know, I like the Gentiles, but now with the boys coming, I better pull over here and I'll play a little politics on the other side, you know. Paul said, listen, the word of God's not politics, it's the word of God. Now, Peter, what you going to do about it? And Peter said, I'm going to play politics. Paul said, okay, you play politics. What's wrong? And he withstood him to the face. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. In other words, when Peter left, those Jews that had been working with the Gentiles and saw the liberty they had, Now, with the coming of the circumcision gang from James and from Jerusalem, 
They said, okay, Peter's gone, we'll go with him. Insomuch that Barnabas also was what? Carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly, according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, Oh, no, that's absolutely contrary to all psychiatric teaching, all psychology teaching. That's right. We are always taught that you take people in private and you talk to them privately. But Peter, I mean, Paul and those fellows just hadn't graduated from the right schools. This is a good answer. My core sometimes wonder why I do things. There's your word. I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and, as, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Boy, what a heavy. Now listen to verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Peter, you know that. That a man is not justified by the works of the law, Peter, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. This faith of Jesus Christ is the believing to the uttermost, which Jesus Christ did. But by the believing to the uttermost that Jesus Christ did, for he fulfilled all the what? Law. Christ was the end of it. He was capable of doing this because he believed God's word. Jesus did. That's why it's accomplished, you understand? Not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, the believing to the uttermost that he did. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the pistis, the believing of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be what? Boy, what a tremendous verse of Scripture. Even today, very few people have the renewed mind on this. They always want to argue with it. Look, it's either God's word, and it's so simple. If you're justified by works, you're justified by works. If you're justified by grace, you're justified by grace. And you've got to make up your mind. I made mine up a long time ago. And I don't budge on it. It doesn't bother me if I brush with Ipana or McLean's. Those works don't concern me. That's where Paul stood Peter. Look at that. Said to Peter, you know that a man isn't justified by works. You know that deep in your heart, Peter. Why don't you walk that way? Because he's justified by the believing of Jesus Christ. But, verse 17, If while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? Even though I'm justified by grace and get caught in sin, Is Christ the minister of that? Is he responsible for that because he gave me the liberty that I have? That's what he's saying. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin because of the liberty, the freedom from the law, not justified by works that he made available? Is therefore he the minister of it? God do what? For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a what? Transgressor. I'm the transgressor. 
For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto whom? God. Dead to the law, that I might do what? dead to it, that I might live unto God. Verse 20. I was crucified is the text. Not I am being crucified, I was, past tense, crucified with whom? When he was crucified, I was crucified with him. When he died, we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. When he arose, we arose with him. When he ascended, we ascended with him. That's why Colossians says, I think, isn't it Colossians, we're already seated, or is it Ephesians? In the heaven. Which one is it? Ephesians. Seated in the what with him? How could we be seated there with him if we're still down in the grave someplace? You see, Jesus Christ was the end of the law, the complete redeemer, the the full Savior. So when he died, we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. And it says, and that was the baptism, when we were buried with him in his death. We were raised in his resurrection. We ascended with him and we were seated with him. That's why it's sort of interesting to look at ourselves from the top down. That's renewed mind. To see yourself seated in the heavenly and knowing who you are here upon earth, far apart many times, and to see yourself from that heavenly position rather than from the sense, knowledge, legalistic works position. That's renewed mind. Seated in the heavenlies, looking down, Man, this ought to give some of us a great big laugh. You know, to see how stupid we really are down here. <laughs> Looking at it from God's point of view, we ought to really have a good laugh on ourselves. I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I what? Boy, I don't know any other people that live any more abundantly than those who recognize they were crucified with Christ. And that they are what the Word of God says they are, and they have what the Word of God says they have. He says, nevertheless, I what? Yet not I, but what? Christ liveth what? That's the key. It's that Christ in us, the hope of glory. That the Gentiles are fellow heirs and of the same body, Christ as thy head. Christ liveth where? In me. That's renewed mind. You're born again of God's Spirit. Where is Christ? In me. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you really believe that? If you do, you've got a renewed mind. The renewed mind has to believe what the Word of God says. Christ in you. Christ in you, Christ in you. That's what makes you more than a conqueror. It is that which guarantees the life which is more than abundant. That has to be in the renewed mind. Now, the world's never going to pat you on the back for that statement. They're going to say, that's not right. If Christ is in you, want to run all over town, get up the dead. <laughs> Don't have to run over town. The fellow's talking to you, Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> you can say, look, talk to you a while, man. <laughs> Lay the word on him. Right? Imagine what happens to people when they come to the realization that it's Christ in them. That's quite a renewed mind. Passed from death unto life, no condemnation, all of that. Doing the will of the Father, alignment and harmony. Just imagine Christ in you. 
That's renewed mind. When you're walking down the street tomorrow or out across the areas, wherever you are, where is Christ? Then when they see you in that proper walk, in the holding forth the greatness of God's word with that love and that tenderness, that grace, that peace, that mercy, when they see that word dwelling richly within you, then they will see Christ. They'll never see him any other way except in you and me. Walking down that factory, in that factory, or up in that shop, sitting at a desk, typing. If you're born again of God's Spirit, Christ's there with you. Now, he's not going to do the typing for you. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> yeah, it'd be awful. But he's there, and God is at work within you to will and to what? His good pleasure. Because it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. God in Christ, Christ in you. And you are a son of God. Boy, what a word, what a word, what a renewed mind. Boy, when you realize that you have what the word of God says you have, now if you, that's not true, you haven't got the new birth either. Because you just can't pick me John 3.16. Or Romans 10, 9, and 10, and then drop the rest of the word. It's either God's word or it isn't. Just imagine how that early church must have blessed the people because they were big enough or humble enough to believe that what God said he meant and what he meant he said. Even to the end that they so electrified the community by their walk. That people said, if I could just put my sick buddy over here, and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when Peter goes by, the sun will be over here in the west, hit Peter about here, his shadow will go over there, and if I can get him within 10 feet of where Peter's going by, God will heal him. That's what I call believing. We haven't seen this in our country. I've seen fragments of it among our people. But it's still small. But I'm looking for the day again when this word of God will have such preeminence in communities that when you people walk there, they'll know God in Christ is walking there. And they'll just get blessed so abundantly because you're there. You already bless the place even if they don't know it. But you bless it by your presence. That's right. Says some place in the Gospels even. If you enter in a certain place with the Word of God and you love people and all the rest of it, they don't like you. Just let the curse be on the house. You go on out and shake the dust off your feet and find you another place. Because whenever you walk into a home with that love of God and you're in alignment and harmony, you bring Christ into that home. Because it's you. That's what Peter was trying, uh, Paul was trying to tell Peter. It's not a matter of the circumcision gang. It's not a matter of whether you eat mashed potatoes or millet. <laughs> Isn't that something? Christ liveth where? In me. Christ liveth in me. That's quite something. Christ living in you is one thing. You living in Christ and making it real is the renewed mind trip. And the life, the life, the life which I now live, I now live since I'm a Christian with Christ in me, the life which I now live in the flesh, in the senses category, I live by the believing the pistis of the Son of God. I live by the believing. What he believed for, what Jesus Christ believed for and accomplished, now since I'm born again, I live by that believing what he accomplished for me. That's what he's saying. Who loved me 
and who gave himself what? For me. That's right. It is Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. It is Jesus Christ who loved us. It is he who died for us. And if he gave himself for me, then I do not have to give me for me. You know, I do not have to do the good works that he did because the good works he did, I could not do because I'd blow it right and left, you know. Now, I'm obligated to the Father because I'm born again to do good works, but not the works Christ did. People talk about you have to bear all these crosses. Well, then what did he bear them for? If he bore the cross for you, then if you think you have to bear it, then something's wrong. Either the word of God's a lie or you are. He became sin that you and I might become what? The righteousness of God in him. How righteous is that? The world will never let you remember that. They'll tell you how unrighteous you are. They'll tell you what a stinker you are. A nincompoop and a no-gooder. They will remind you of things you did 20 years ago. Really neat, isn't it? You know, the mind of man is just about that wide, most of them. Sometimes I think that wide. Men will always remember, you know, even today, if you would make a mistake and do anything wrong, they'd sure remember that one. But how about the hundreds of times you blessed them, prayed for them, and loved them? That one they just don't seem to remember. That's man. You know, it's sort of neat when you so renew your mind how you can put up with people. It gets to the place they don't even bother you. You don't like it, you know. You'd rather have blueberry pie with ice cream, but you, you know, they don't stop you. <laughs> really something. New Knoxville called, they tell me, and wondered why we're pumping all the water out of the ground. They're mad. Bother me any. Let them put in some stupid pumps. They lived off of the, the hydro, you know, the thing blowing out of the top of the ground by itself for 40 years, never spent a quarter to put a well in. Why don't they put a well in? They're mad at me. I didn't put the water in the ground. <laughs> That's something. Well, they can just be good and me. Right. Somebody else this week told me what kind of devilish man my father was. Yeah. And I suppose if this fella really... I don't think he's ever done anything that's worth looking at for the Lord in all the years I've known him. At least my father walked. At least he did some wonderful things. Now, he may have been an income poop at that one incident. I don't know. I'll tell you something. I don't give a hoot because it was 50 years ago, and that's a hell of a long time to remember something. <laughs> you know, isn't that, man, you must have a squeezed mind <laughs> to try to remember something that somebody, in your opinion, mistreated you on 50 years ago? <laughs> Thought to myself, how grateful I am that it is by grace and that no man has to stand before any other man, but he has to stand before God. And these people that yak this week, they still going to stand before God. Right now they think, you know, they're big wigs, they rule the thing. They could buy and sell what they want to. But you know something? When that time comes, no man buys or sells much of anything. He's just very thankful if he's even breathing. 
And there's one sure thing when it comes to the material realm, nobody's going to take it with them. You can leave her here in the government. That's okay with me. Because you've been so used to paying them all your living, you might as well stay acclimatized when you're dead. Get so accustomed to it. That was Will Rogers said that. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's not the Lord speaking of that. <laughs> but isn't it something? Lord, if I'd have to remember all the baloney I've had to stand through the years, I'd have never got anything done positive. <laughs> but to get to the place where you renew your mind, you know who you are in Christ Jesus, you know who he is, you know what the word says, and say, well, if it's wrong, I'd go down with the word, but I'm sure going to have a good time. <laughs> I'm going to have, be, 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 because before that, you never did have a good time, and you know it. When you lived under all that legalism and all that condemnation, how good was the time? Ho, ho, ho. Some of you didn't want to live under it, but they helped you to, to do it. Blessed you when you did and so forth. People, that was Paul's confrontation with Peter. He said, why do you want to get back under all that stuff out of which you came? No, it's like going back to Egypt to make bricks without straw again. When you've crossed the Jordan into the promised land, try. Love me and gave himself for me. I wasn't worthy. Don't tell me that. I know it better than you. I don't come around and tell you you weren't worthy. You know it better than I do. <laughs> Well, for both of us, he just gave his life. And I'm just tickled to death he did. He gave himself. Loved me and what? He what? Loved me. Yeah, he loved me and gave himself. Me. I've had a problem loving even me. <laughs> now it says that Christ so loved that he loved me. Well, I tell you, that takes a big Christ to love me. Well, I can be the most unlovable person in the whole world. He did it. He did it. You know some praise God he did? So I just say, thank the Lord, he loved me. He loved me. He loved me. Wonderful. I got love. He loved me. Even when I was dead in trespass and sins, without God, without hope, he loved me. And then he gave himself for me. That kind of Savior I want to live for. <laughs> Remember the time we prayed that old fellow out of the hospital in Van Wert? Bless his old soul. He was a fellow I stuck my head in that oxygen tent, remember? I said, you want me to pray for you? And he said, well, what in the hell do you think I called you over here for? <laughs> if it had been me, I'd have hit him. <laughs> I'd have said, that's real or religious man who loved me and what? Oh. That just melts you, doesn't it? You must have loved him too, that if he loved me, right? By the way, next, next day he got all that hospital and came over to our little old hacienda and said, that kind of a savior, I want to get saved. How do I do it? See? That kind of savior is a fantastic. What's the only one there is? There is no other gospel. <laughs> That's right. There's only one. That's why he said in verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. How do you like that one? Whenever it's anything less than the grace and the love of God, it's always frustration. You know, you're frustrating it. You're blowing it. You're coughing out. You're lying. That's what you're doing. It's not nice to lie, you know that. It isn't quite kosher. <laughs> I don't frustrate the grace of what? God. That's right. I don't frustrate it. Paul perhaps didn't understand it all, no more so than maybe you understand it all or understand it all. I don't understand grace. It's just too big. <laughs> well, I sure like it. 
That's right. I don't understand how a blueberry grows on a little old twig or vine, whatever it's on. But I sure like it when Mrs. Bowen makes me her favorite blueberry pie. Sends it over with ice cream so I can have her out of mood. Thank you, Mrs. Bowen. So, I do not frustrate the grace of God. He was saying to Peter, when you do that kind of cop-out back to that old legalistic trip, you're frustrating the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. How simple that is. The renewed mind has to say this and believe it. If righteousness comes by the law or anything that you do, then Christ died in vain. So whenever there's one person who puts one iota of legalism on you, the law, he is frustrating the grace of God, and for him, Christ died in vain. He may be born again of God's Spirit. There's no doubt about that occurring at times. And he's going to be in heaven, but he's sure frustrating the grace of God on earth. And he's going to have a miserable time trying to live it legalistically. Because no man ever gets that good, except he gets to the point that he fools himself, and then he condemns everybody else that doesn't just quite live like he does. You know, they tell me scientifically that no two snowflakes are alike. That takes a pretty big God who invented it and patented that little mold. <laughs> And I've learned long ago there are never any two individuals alike except that we're all dead in trespasses and sins until we're born again. And when we're born again, we all have the same Christ with us. But as far as the general pattern, no two individuals. Identical twins are never identical. That's just a word they use. They don't have a better word, so let's say it's identical. But... No two people are ever alike. That's why in this walk, in the greatness of the renewed mind, maybe something that I before the Father could do, you might not be able to do. I don't know. But I do know that when the Word says that righteousness didn't come by the law, it came by the believing or the faith of Jesus Christ, and righteousness just if, if you're justified, you're made righteous. And if you're righteous, you have to be justified. If it came by the law, then Christ died in one. And ladies and gentlemen, if that would be true, then I am of all men the greatest liar in the world today. And you're fools for being here tonight. That's right. Then the way ministry is an absolute counterfeit, and we ought to just all die and get out of it or quit or do something. That's right. It's either the truth of God's word or it isn't. If it's any other way than what the word says in that chapter here that I've just read with you tonight, then Christ died in vain. Then really you're not born again of God's spirit. There is no eternal life. You really don't speak in tongues and interpret or prophesy. which trip you want to go. I'd like with all my heart to follow that, which the Word of God declares that we have in Christ Jesus. And I'd like to renew my mind to say what that Word says and to walk as that Word says. And I believe that's why you're here tonight. I believe that's why the way ministry is existing today because it's declaring this again to God's people. And I can hardly wait for the Rock of Ages. It's like I have a troublesome time waiting for the gathering to gather, but I have to, I guess. <laughs> but to be with people like you again for a week, of, and like Thursday, Friday, just to be there where you are, 
just to be blessed with your blessing, to be loved with your love, to be prayed for with your prayers, just to have a body together. 5,000, 10,000. It's wonderful. It's like when you're home with your own kids and you love them and they love you and you have Christ at the center of that home and you're all tickled to death to be there. Hardly wait for it. So I'll wait till the 15th, maybe, of August. Then we get together and for three or four days we just believe God for the greatness of that love because I know he did not die in vain. And you know it. So why don't you just renew your mind, say what the Word says. It's so simple. Father, thank you for the privilege of teaching my people again tonight. Done my best, Father. You'll just have to cover where it wasn't so good. And you're just going to have to make this Word of God living and real to people that they have a wonderful understanding of it, all of its greatness. We surely thank you for the privilege of enjoying your divine presence. And I thank you, Father, that any man, woman, or child who wants to know your word can know it. And there is no excuse for not knowing it in our day and time. And I bless your people here tonight as they go forth this week, that they'll hold forth the greatness of that word with all their love and tenderness and everything else that's in them. And may it be a wonderful week of the outreach of the word around the nations of the world through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Bless you. Walter, what do we want to sing and then you close the service out? What are you going to sing? Unworthy. That would be pretty good. How would you like to sing Unworthy? <laughs> Number 84, one of my great favorites. All right, Rhoda. <laughs> do the first verse for you. Ready? <laughs> it's going to cost you. We'll take another offering. <laughs> no, we're not. Look, I want to tell you a little about this song. When I first introduced this song, I'd known it, I don't know how long, some of the people who love me very much said, oh, but I'm surprised at that, that you'd take something as negative as this and introduce. I said, you just never looked at that word. And I read it with them and took them into the depths of it. And it, then they started crying about it. But it's all there. Look at it. Unworthy was I of the grace that he gave. Unworthy to hold to his hand. Amazing that our God would reach down to the earth. This love